you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy of all glory, all honor, all power. Lord, let's do your holy, precious name. Father, tonight as we just dwell in your presence, Lord, we ask that you would minister to our hearts. Lord, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us, God. As we're looking to our Father, as we're looking to our Savior, to our King, Lord. So thank you again for tonight. Bless our time, Lord, be with these precious little angels as they come and share with us, Lord. Speak to our hearts through the songs and worship that they sing. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Well, God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we welcome you here tonight to our uh, Christmas Eve service. We have a very special treat for you. Um, these wonderful boys and girls have been practicing for a very long time uh, these worship. Christmas songs that they'd like to share with you. So, would you join me as we welcome our uh, South Hill Calvary Chapel Children's Choir.
became a servant to the lost of the Lord of Lords. We celebrate this joyous time reflecting on his birth, not born in a mansion, but in a state where he had a birth. He came so he could identify with the human heart of man and he gave his life as a sacrifice offering a better plan. Plan that reconciles us back to our loving Father God, bringing hope and redemption from Satan's ruling iron earth. For this is the only reason that we should celebrate this day and to become focused on our mind, anything else will take the meaning of it.
That was that was great. That was great, guys. Give him a call. Way to go. You guys sang loud. You did you did so well. The Lord is so pleased at the effort you kids put in to these uh, these songs tonight. I know it blessed his heart. Now, uh, because I am not physically capable of containing 40 uh, children on, New on Christmas Eve, we're going to have the parents stand where you are, and the kids are going to come to you. Now, I know you might, might not, you might be thinking, I didn't save them seats. Yeah, it's because there's no seats to save. So let them just plop down on your laps or whatever they have to do. So parents, go ahead and stand where you are. Children, locate your parents. Once you've found them, you may make your way there. And thank you guys once again. Amen. Amen. Wasn't that awesome? Amen. I just love what the Bible says about children when Jesus said... Uh, the apostles remember you know as you get older you're, you just get stuffier I know some of you I was thinking about how some of them get through the program you know they're, they're just some some are just you know they're just they come all nice and pristine and everything and then pretty soon the shirt tails out and everything and I was thinking about some of you how you what do you do because you don't rock back and forth and you don't get here's what adults do they just kind of doze off. So I love just the enthusiasm of the kids. And that's why Jesus said when the apostles, they, they didn't understand. A lot of, a lot of the time of, of the apostles with Jesus, they were always trying to figure out what he was thinking. And uh, one of the things that they did is the little children, they just loved Jesus. And they, they ran to Jesus. And the, the apostles were trying to get, get the, uh, the kids to stay away from Jesus. And Jesus said, no. He said, let the little children come unto me, for unless you come to me as a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And there's so much we can learn uh, from children. I was so blessed to be uh, backstage, and I had an opportunity to pray with them, and I, I just love our kids. I don't get to back to the children's ministry very often. I'm very excited. I was just asked to, to speak at the children, to do a message at the children's ministry, or the children's retreat which I'm really, really excited about. But I love going back there and they'll go, hey, Pastor Ron, hey. And one, one young man, I said, you all look so nice. And he said, and he was just looking at this out. He was decked out. And uh, I said, did you just get that for this? And he said, yeah, I did. They're just so full of life. And so it's always fun when we, when we gather together uh, like this. I went to, uh, I love Christmas Eve. I love Christmas Eve day. I love every part of Christmas Eve. And from the morning, and I went and I worked out uh, this morning, and there weren't tons of people at the Y, and then I stopped at Target to get those last couple of things. And <clears throat> how many of you men, I, how many of you brothers are a little nervous because you haven't done your shopping yet? <laughs> you know what? We're just going to pray for you because you're in a heap of trouble. You are in a heap of trouble. As some of you ladies may be saying the same thing, you know, Pastor, I didn't get, you know, it's okay. There's a special grace upon the women uh, you don't worry about it. And if your husband gives you a bad time because you didn't get something, you just remember, I know you already do remember, you remember all those things and then fight that temptation to bring it up. But as a last resort, if he gives you a bad time, go, out, go ahead and pull out those trump cards. It's totally okay to do that. <clears throat> I want to take just a few minutes uh, this evening to read a part of the Christmas story that we're not quite as familiar with in terms of reading it at Christmas. But I think it's important to look at it as part of the Christmas story because the Christmas story is about the birth of our Savior. As the kids shared and sang about so beautifully, it's about the birth of our Savior, the baby Jesus, the baby Jesus born in a manger. Why? As the angel told Joseph, to save people from their sins. He was born to take away the sins of his people. And I think it's important for us as adults and as children to understand, to know in the depths of our hearts that Jesus' birth was God's divine plan. 
Listen, it is so easy to think of Jesus' birth as just something that we celebrate once a year. And I've shared with you before in years past that so often we can, we, we get the, uh, the manger, the nativity scene out, and we get the little baby Jesus out. And some of you may, when, when my kids were growing up, we would wait to put the baby Jesus in the manger until uh, Christmas morning. <clears throat> but quite frankly, a lot of times we, uh, when Christmas is over, we pack up the baby Jesus and we put him away. And sometimes we can forget that Jesus is so much more, that that baby that was in a manger is so much more than what Christmas is about. It goes way beyond that. And it's important to understand that some 4,000 years before Jesus' birth, there was a plan to redeem fallen sinful man, an imperfect man, to a holy and a perfect God. And that's what Jesus' birth is all about. I want to just read a part of the Christmas story that we're not quite as familiar with, although in some respects we are, out of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. Just listen carefully. We'll just take a few, mom a few moments because I know many of you are excited to go home and to be a part of the festivities. So blessed that you came out to be a part of this. Well, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew writes, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. I shared this last Sunday that we tend to think of, because of uh, you know, Christmas stories and nativity sets and and we tend to think of, of, the, of the wise men being just three wise men because of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I think also because uh, imagine a nativity scene with a hundred magi would get a little bit pricey. And where would you put it? You know, on your piano or on your table. But the reality is it's believed that as many as a hundred wise men actually came to worship Jesus. And this is what got Herod all stirred up. It says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Now, why was he troubled? Because Herod, we know, was a wicked king. He was a very jealous king and he wanted all of the attention. And it says that when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Now, this is significant. This is significant because we come to understand that the birth of Jesus in a stable, in a feeding trough, that the birth of Jesus was something that God had planned hundreds and hundreds of years before it actually took place. And he quotes the prophet Micah, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so 700 years before Jesus was born, Micah the prophet had prophesied, God had spoken through Micah, that the, this Messiah would be born, who would save people from their sins. Well, Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And so we see right in the beginning, Right in the beginning, as Jesus, the Savior of the world, the one who would come to save mankind from their sins, right away there's a deceitful plot to get rid of him. And isn't it interesting that today there is a similar plot today? How many of you have just heard, happy holidays, happy holidays? In fact, uh, I was reading, a, I was at Starbucks the other day, and I was seeing a book, and it was, it was talking about it just, just Christmas, and I, I didn't have a chance to read through the whole book, but it, it kept mentioning holiday, holiday, holiday. And you know that it's not politically correct to say a Merry Christmas. And so from the very beginning of Jesus' birth, there was, this, there was this attempt to undermine God's divine plan. There was an attempt to do away, and Herod was part of that. And he comes in and he says, well, you let me know when you find him, because I want to come and worship him as well. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over, the, the young, over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, I love this, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Not just they rejoiced. No. They rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. 
And when God's people gather together to worship Jesus as we have tonight, we worship with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, now that's interesting, it doesn't say when they had come into the stable, again, that's what tradition has done, that's what Hollywood has done, that's what the story has done over the years. No, this was days, days, perhaps weeks, or even months later, when they came to the house to, to worship the child. And when they, and, and, and they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then, it says, being divinely warned in a dream. Now, why is that significant? Because from the beginning, when wicked man was planning, was, was conniving, was scheming to rid the world of a savior, God was making a way to ensure that the savior would accomplish his death on the cross to pay the penalty for man's sin. And so they were divinely warmed in a dream, God making sure that Jesus grew to be a man. Being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. So he quotes another prophet, and this time it was the prophet Hosea, who had prophesied that they would be divinely warned to flee to Egypt to, to escape. Herod's plan to destroy Jesus 700 years before his birth. And then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and he put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. And again, we see God's divine plan to protect this child. Why? Was he born to just so that we could celebrate Christmas and exchange gifts and then we can put him away? No, he was born to grow, to become a man, to proclaim, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. To die on the cross, to pay the penalty for man's sin, that whosoever believes in him, the Bible says, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so he took the child and his mother and they came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archaeus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there and being warned by God in a dream. Again, God's divine plan to protect Jesus, to, to, to be able to make sure that this plan of, of salvation of mankind was, was protected, was preserved. And he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. I believe what the Lord would want us to know tonight as we prepare to go home and to begin to celebrate in the various traditions that we celebrate Christmas Eve and then tomorrow Christmas Day, I believe what he would want us to know is that God wants to be in control of every aspect of our lives in order to accomplish all of his plans and his purposes and just like it was God's divine plan that Jesus would be born and crucified and risen from the dead so it is with the plan that he has for our lives but the question is is are we cooperating with the divine plan that he has and one of the ways we know that divine plan. One of the ways that Joseph and, and Mary and the prophets of old understood God's divine plan is they worshiped Jesus as king. 
as Lord and Savior of our lives. And this is what Christmas is all about. It's worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's why we're gathered together here this Christmas Eve. And there may be some of you here who have never heard or never understood that God has a divine plan for your life. Maybe some of you over the years have just been guilty of just unpacking the baby Jesus and repacking him and unpacking him and repacking him and unpacking him and repacking him for years and years and years. And you've never stopped to think that God had foretold not only his birth, but his crucifixion and his resurrection from the dead to reconcile mankind to himself. That's why we're gathered here. That's why we feel the things we feel at Christmas. Listen, there may be some of you here who have never placed your trust and faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But I want you to just listen carefully to me for a moment. That feeling that you get on Christmas, that feeling that you get in just a moment as we light the candles and as we begin to sing Silent Night, those feelings that you get, listen carefully, that is the Holy Spirit drawing you to the manger, drawing you to the Christ child who grew up to be a man for the sole purpose of dying for the sins of the world. And my prayer and my encouragement to you is listen to what the Spirit says. Listen to what the Spirit is speaking to your hearts right now about Christmas. My prayer would be that the uh, the, by the end of our service for many of you, for all of you really, is that Christmas would never be the same. Because you would understand that it was always a part of God's divine plan that he should be born, that he should die, that we would be assured of a place for all eternity in heaven. Father, that is our prayer. That is our prayer, Lord, that you would just reveal by the Holy Spirit the reason that Jesus was born. For it was the Apostle John that said, in the beginning was the Word in reference to Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, Jesus became flesh, and he dwelt among us. Lord, our prayer would be tonight as we prepare to take communion. Our prayer would be, Lord, that you would just minister to our hearts and that we would just allow the, the worship and the, the Spirit to just speak to our hearts regarding this miraculous, marvelous birth of Jesus. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, the Savior of the world, wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, whose government and peace will have no end. Let's just take a few moments and let's worship this King. Let's worship this baby Jesus. And the ushers are going to be distributing the communion. And we would just invite you that if you've placed your faith and trust in Christ to just partake with us. Hold on to the cup and the bread. And then we'll partake together as a church family and many of you guests who have joined us as well. And if some of your children have not reached that age of being able to make that commitment to Christ and they're Take that opportunity to tell them what communion is all about and what it represents. Let's just worship the Lord together and then we'll take communion together. I'm forgiven because you were the Savior. I'm accepted. You were
early church was um, grew from 120 to 3,000 imagine what that was like with 3,000 and they didn't have children's ministries back then so everybody's all together I mean you can kind of hear the kids melting down a little I mean can you imagine they would teach for hours on end talk about meltdown it's totally it's such a blessing I love these family services You know, babies, we're so blessed. Uh, this, this last year, the Lord has blessed us with three new grandchildren, bringing our total to 10. And I want you to think with me for a moment, 
How many of you have grandchildren and you just, or, or just this last year have had a little baby in your, in your, come into your lives? Oh, how precious. Now I want you to imagine for a moment what God the Father went through. Watching his son become a baby. Knowing that he would die on the cross. Just imagine what Mary went through. So many powerful songs have been written. The broken heart as she was looking at her son hanging on the cross. When Jesus would say, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And why did he do that? He did it for us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, it's important that on Christmas Eve that we take communion together as a church. As a church family, why? Because it's a reminder to us of why Jesus was born. And it was Jesus himself who instituted the Lord's Supper communion to the disciples, to those 12. And he said, as he took the bread and he broke it, he said, this is my body which has been broken for you. As often as you eat of this, do it in remembrance of me. He wanted them every time they broke the bread and partook, he wanted them to remember his body on the cross. Why? Because he, he wanted to just be morbid? No, not at all. He wanted them to remember the price that was paid to wipe away the sin of the world. And here we are some 2,000 years later and we have the bread broken. As we partake of the bread this evening, this Christmas evening, Let's do it in remembrance of the precious body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's partake together. And then Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Representing my blood, which has been shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. The Bible was very clear from the Old Testament into the New that without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. What is the significance of the blood? We know, even today, we know that God designed it that life is in blood. You can't live without your blood. People die when there's diseases in the blood, when the blood isn't functioning properly. And yet Jesus' blood shed on the cross it always accomplishes the purpose for which it was shed to reconcile fallen man to himself. That's what makes communion on Christmas Eve such a powerful and special thing. He took the cup and he said, this is my blood which has been shed for you for the remission, for the removal of sin. It was Jesus shed blood that satisfied the wrath of God upon a sinful man. He took our place. As we've heard before, he paid a debt we, he did not owe because we could not pay a debt that we did owe. As we partake of the cup this evening, let's remember the precious blood of our Lord Jesus. Baby born in the manger, born to die, for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's partake together. As you came in, you were handed candles And if the ushers could turn out the lights, that would be great. And let me just, just uh, 
for a safety factor. Hate to break the spirit with a little safety, but I, it really break the spirit if somebody got lit on fire at this time. I just want to encourage you that that what is it? Junior high and older. Junior high and older. If you could only have them hold the candles. Now I know the children are going to be anxious to hold one, and just let them hold your hand as you're holding the candle. We. We just, there's so many people here and we don't want anybody to, let's just hold up for just a minute on the candles, just for a minute. We don't want anybody to um, get lit on fire. So if the parents would please hold the candles and junior high and older. I want to just share just briefly before we light the candles and sing. Have you ever thought about why a candlelight service is so special? I was actually challenged this, this year. Pastor Phil said, you know, maybe you should say something about why we do a candlelight service. And I've always done them because it's just so pretty. It just looks so awesome. And I thought, well, that's a good point. Maybe I better give that some thought. And as I was thinking about it, I couldn't help but think about what Jesus said shortly after he ministered to the woman caught in the act of adultery. And he said to her, remember, he said, go and sin no more. Does no one condemn you? Neither do I. And shortly after that, listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 8. He said, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And I have always been fascinated by the fact, listen, that the smallest amount of light dispels the greatest amount of darkness. And the greatest amount of darkness cannot extinguish the smallest amount of light. And Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now here's a very cool thing that I want you to think about as we're lighting these candles and singing Silent Night. When Jesus left to go to heaven, he left the responsibility to be his light to the world. To us he said in Matthew chapter 5 you are the light of the world and a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven and as we light these candles tonight I want you to think about Am I being a light to the world? And if you're not being a light to the world, just say, Lord, will you help me to be your light to a dark world that your good works would glorify yourself? We live in a very dark world these days. Jesus said in John chapter 3, this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And yet men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What makes a candlelight service so special is that it reminds us of Jesus, the light of the world, who dispels the darkness around us and reminds us how very much God loves us. It reminds us that this truly is what Christmas is all about. Amen. Let's sing together.
No, Lord Jesus, this evening we celebrate the eve of your birth. And Lord, we thank you that you were willing to leave your rightful place in heaven to be born a humble man, a simple man, like us in every way but without sin, in order to reconcile us to our Creator. Lord, help us, Lord, to be the light of the world. Help us, Lord, to fulfill what you commissioned us to do. Lord, the times in which we live, they're dark. And for those of us who have lived 30, 40, 50 years, 60, 70, we've seen times get worse. And yet, Lord, it's nights like tonight where we're reminded how good you are and the peace that comes from looking to you. And so, Lord, as we conclude our service this evening, help us to be an accurate reflection of you, the light of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, if you blow your candles out and let's stand together. God bless you. Have a, have a merry, blessed Christmas this evening and then tomorrow. Be careful going home. We're going to close with the joy to the world. And uh, we'll see you all hopefully on Sunday. Love to see a lot of you then.